Page mm-hmm. 157. I'm so stuffed, I can't even finish what's on my plate. As soon as the tables are cleared, Jo asks, starts asking if we can go out. Mommy calls un segundito from the kitchen, and in a moment, she comes back in, carrying a birthday cake in the shape of the island, with 13 candles flaming away on top. Everyone starts singing happy birthday to me, since we won't all be together next week, Tia Laura explains. Mommy sets the cake down in front of me so I can make a wish before I blow out the candles. But I can only think of one thing I really want, which I can't get. Maybe Mommy can tell what I'm wishing for because she puts her hand around my shoulders and whispers in my ear, if you want, save the wish for later. Which seems like a good idea since I can't think straight with 16 people telling me to hurry before the candles melt down into the cake. So can we go out now? Joe asks as soon as we're done with the cake. The snow has been falling steadily since we came indoors. Tia Laura shakes her head. You have to finish your digestion first. I can't believe Tia Laura has gotten even more strict in the United States. Snow is made of water, I feel like telling her. It's not an ocean where you can drown if you swim right after a meal. But Mommy is stressed that we are guests on our best behavior. I'm not about to remind my aunt that this is supposed to be the land of freedom. The aunts and uncles push back their chairs and begin to tell stories. My grandmother starts off, a story about when my poppy was my age. As she begins, I realize that it's a story I've heard before, and my grandmother is getting a lot of the details wrong. Mommy whispers that Mamita is all confused with grief, to let it be. I keep glancing out the window, watching the snow coming down thicker and thicker. I'm so glad my first snowfall happened before I turned 13. I've been wanting to cram lots of things in before next week, so when I have kids, I can tell them, by the time I was your age, I'll have a lot to say. By the time I was your age, I had lived in a closet, I had survived a dictatorship, I had had two boyfriends, sort of, and I had lost my father. Tia Laura sees me looking out the window, and I think she feels bad denying me anything right now. Okay, okay, she says. If the mountain won't mate for Muhammad, then Muhammad better go to the mountain. Bundle up. Joe and Carla and Sandy and I put on our boots and coats. Little Fifi nags that she wants to go, and finally her mother gives in. Lucinda says that we're crazy loquitas going outdoors when it's so cold. Where are our brains? Mundin shakes his head when I ask him if he wants to come along. He's listening to the poppy stories as if he's never heard them before. Tia Laura says Mundin is taking it the hardest, if you can measure stuff like that. I guess if hands are the measure, I'd have to agree. All you have to do is look down at my brother's fingernails to see what he's been doing in his spare time. At the door, Carla slips away to the basement phone. She has an important call to make while her mother's at the table. I know who it is, too. She'll dial Kevin's house, and once he's on the line, hangs up. As we go out, I hear my grandfather telling the story of how he bought the land for the compound after the big hurricane of 1930. I know that story, too. How he built his house, and then each of his sons and daughters married and built theirs all around his, instead of like now, one in the Bronx, one in Miami, and a daughter in Queens. He's explaining that the new government will be returning the compound to us, that we'll have to decide if we want to sell the property or keep it. And then his voice is cut off abruptly by the storm door banging closed behind me. A few days ago, Tio Pepe was in New York City with the Italian ambassador on some official business, and he came out to see us at the Garcias. Mommy wept and thanked him for being so brave and helping us during a dangerous time. My gratitude is to you, Tio Pepe bowed, and to your children, who sacrificed a husband and a father to liberate our country. Tio Pepe had a letter for me from Oscar. Carla was super curious, but I wouldn't show it to her. I was afraid she'd start building an elaborate Romeo and Juliet romance about Oscar, just as I once did. Carla is also always asking about my diary, but it still hurts too much to read it over by myself, much less share it with somebody else. To tell the truth... I don't know how I feel about Oscar or about anything else anymore. I walk around and pretend everything's okay. Meanwhile, inside, I'm all numb, as if I'd been buried in sadness and my body got free, but the rest of me is still in captivity. In his letter, Oscar has just heard about my father. He said it was so sad. He said to remember that my father and my uncle were the heroes who had liberated our country. He sounded just like his father. It made me cry all over again. He also explained that he had tried to write to me lots of times, 
But up until a week ago, the dictator's family was in control, and nothing but essential correspondence was being allowed out. Now they fled, and the country is going to hold the first free elections in 31 years. Everyone will get a chance to vote for a president. All because of your father and your uncle and their friends. You must be so proud. Oscar had other news. He had been to Wimpy's where he had seen Chucha. When he told her he was writing to me, she said to tell me to remember my wings. Chucha must have long distance vision that she can see how low and sad I'm feeling. I guess I finally understand what she and Poppy meant by wanting me to fly. It was like the metaphors Mrs. Brown was always talking about. To be free inside, like an uncaged bird. Then nothing, not even a dictatorship, can take away your liberty. Oscar also said that the American school would be opening soon. Meanwhile, he and some of our classmates were back to having lessons in the old nursery room upstairs. The holes in the walls were plugged up and the shelves of books dusted off. Recently, what a surprise! Oscar found the Queen of Hearts bookmark in the Swiss family Robinson. When we came back from the beach, he wrote at the end, I could tell things had changed. Mommy and Poppy began eating their suppers with us, and Mommy stopped putting her leftovers in a plastic bag on her lap. I still stand in the yard, though, and look up at a certain window. I read and reread Oscar's letter alone by myself in the Garcia's bathroom with the door locked, just like in those old sad days in hiding, writing in my diary in the Mancini's bedroom. The snow really is as magical as Mommy said it would be, and it's falling so thickly and yet so silently that one thing doesn't seem to match the other. Everything is covered with a fluffy layer of white, like a wedding cake you don't want to cut into. The cars, the bushes, the bird feeders, even the lids on the garbage cans are wearing white hats. It's so breathlessly beautiful. This is something I don't want to forget. A brand new world no one's had the chance to ruin yet. And it makes you feel lighthearted too. Sandy starts doing ballet leaps that look pretty silly in a winter coat, and Joe staggers around as though she's drunk to get a laugh out of us. I look up and hundreds of butterfly kisses rain on my face. For the first time since we heard the news, I feel as if I'm waking up from the bad dream I keep having, where I'm being buried alive as a substitute because no one can find Poppy's body. I close my eyes, and instead of Poppy and Teotoni walking on the beach, I see Poppy sitting on the edge of my bed on a day not long ago in a place now so far away, saying, promise me, promise me. I shake my head to toss the memory away. Flakes of snow fly off from my hair. Oh, don't shake it that way, Sandy pleads. It looks so pretty, like tiny little marshmallows. Anita bonita, Anita bonita. She starts up a chant. Her sisters join in. I smile, but I feel like crying, remembering Poppy's marshmallow crown that Mommy reminded me about when we were in hiding. Almost anything anyone says these days can spark a memory. Let's make a snowman, Fifi says. Peace, peace, peace. It's hard to resist her cute lisp, but Sandy says she has a better idea. Let's make angels instead. They're so much prettier, she coaxes, because Fifi looks cross. Sandy explains how we have to lie down on the ground and swing our arms and legs up and down, which sounds kind of messy, but also fun. Something to put on a pre-13 list of things I've done. We throw ourselves on the snow and swing like mad. Then we're all so cold, we run shrieking indoors. You're going to catch your deathly colds, Tia Laura scolds as she towels Fifi off. It's surprising, once you're listening for it, how often people bring up dying to try to scare you. But now that Poppy is dead, it doesn't seem so scary to die. Sometimes I think it's scarier to be alive, especially when you feel that you'll never be as happy and carefree as when you were a little kid. But I keep remembering Chucha's dream. She saw us sprouting wings and flying up and away. It has to mean more than our coming to the United States. After all, as Chucha herself would say, what good is it to escape captivity only to be imprisoned in your own misery? Later that night, the Garcia girls and I sit around the bedroom we all share, talking about how much we all ate and how we're all going on diets tomorrow. Tio Carlos is back from driving two shifts of relatives to the subway, and now he's lying in bed reading some history book that would put even an owl to sleep. Downstairs, Mommy and Tia Laura and Lucinda are sitting at the kitchen table, remembering stuff that happened in the past. Mundine is taking out the garbage, and Fifi is fast asleep in the other bedroom down the hall. It amazes me that in this small house, somehow like a puzzle, everyone actually fits in. 
Carla goes up to the window that looks out over the backyard to the other backyards on the block to see if she can see his bedroom light. How she knows it's Kevin's bedroom, I don't know. Seeing her standing there, I remember all those times when I used to look out the window hoping to see Oscar in the yard. Now I wonder if I was really in love with him or with that little square of freedom, the breeze in my hair and the sun on my skin. Hey, you guys, Carla points. Come see your snow angels. Oh, look how cute. Fifi's is so small. We join her at the window. Mundine must have forgotten to flick off the outdoor switch because the backyard is flooded with light. What I see as I look down aren't angels, but butterflies. The arm swings connect to the leg swings like a pair of wings, our heads poking out in between. I'm sure if Chucho was here, she would say they're a sign. Four butterflies from Poppy, reminding me to fly. I close my eyes, but instead of making a wish, I think about Poppy and Tio Tony and their friends who died to make us all free. The emptiness inside starts filling with a strong love and a brave pride. Okay, Poppy, I say. I promise I'll try.